now. What's up, Dementors, and welcome to another episode of Phantology. We're going to be reviewing Harry Potter 3, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban by J.K. Rowling. And I have the typical Harry Potter crew, Dan and Nathan, on the line. What's up, guys? Hey, how's it going? Happy to be back. Hey, guys, if we screw this up, we can, we can use a time turner, right? Yeah, I wish I had a time turner for our previous episode because the audio was a bit iffy there, but we've, uh, we've changed our setup and we should be good to go. So bringing you the highest fidelity version of Phantology this time. What'd you guys think of that line though? I've been thinking about that intro line for more than a week now. <laughs> it's been a week. Is it? Dan. <laughs> did you want more of a laugh afterwards? <laughs> I did, but it's okay. Maybe I, other hey, people I that thought, are listening are laughing. I thought it was pretty good. I Thanks, thought it was man. pretty good. Yeah, listeners, let us know if you thought that was funny or not. If you like what we're doing <laughs> at Phantology, check us out at social media at Phantology Books. We have a website, www.phantologybooks.com, where all of our links are posted. And if you want to chat with us, uh, we have a Discord. So hop on there and chat us up. Let us know what we're doing wrong, what you like, what you don't like, and maybe even consider looking us up on Patreon where we have some exclusives. So you guys are, are big fans of the channel. I mean, I know you're guest stars, but you're Discord frequenters, right? Yes, yeah. I am. I've joined I, the community. I, I've joined Discord. I think it's pretty funny. Yeah, really good times to be had at Phantology. But enough of a plug for our channel. Let's talk some. Uh, let's talk some Harry Potter. So this is the third book. Obviously, um, this one was. Uh, this is a fun book for me. I thought this was where we really start to kind of like settle into the school feel. Like the whole plot of the of the book is going from class to class for, for a large portion of the time. And the first two books aren't quite that much. Uh, aren't that way quite as much. And then the the future books are going to be like that as well so i guess before we talk too much like what do you guys think of this book how does it line up uh, how does it stack up with the first two that we've already reviewed so previous to the reread that i just had i just finished reading this within the last week i always thought that this was my favorite harry potter book or if not my favorite in the top three at least but after reading this one i feel like it slotted down a little bit a lot mostly because the biggest appeal of this book is because it has the huge surprise ending um, and it has the really adrenaline rush, like the last three chapters just go zooming by and there's just everything gets pieced together all at once at the end, which is really cool the first time you read it. But on the reread, it's not as exciting. So we just reviewed the second book and the third book. And my opinion on the second book, Chamber of Secrets, went up after the reread and Prisoner of Azkaban went slightly down. But it's obviously still a favorite. It's very enjoyable to read. Um, I have the opposite opinion. This is one of my favorite books of Harry Potter. I said it was I one really, of my favorite books. Well, Harry, this is number three. <laughs> I really like it because it it's the only book that doesn't have Voldemort in it. And so a lot of people are just like, well, like get to the chase. Like, yeah, Harry's going to fight Voldemort. But I really like it just because it's a filler and it's, it's such a huge character development for each of the characters that are in this series. So one of the beasts I have with it is I, I wish there was more Voldemort. I require Voldemort in my Harry Potter books. And, and that was one thing that I maybe don't like as much. So interesting that you do like that, Nathan. Yeah, I'm going to push, I, I really I'm gonna like push back book. on that. Yeah, I agree with Nathan because Sirius Black, the way that he's described before that you find out that he's just your friendly uncle. Before that, he seems more terrifying, honestly, than Voldemort to me. Because, I mean. because up to this point, Voldemort's been vanquished and Sirius Black is a real person. Yeah. yeah, Voldemort was vanquished by a baby, whereas Sirius Black can kill more than a dozen people with one curse. And he slashes yeah. up paintings and, and appears in front of your best friend in the middle of the night with a bloody knife. So yeah, yeah, I guess I could see that. He's, he's kind of terrifying. Yeah, and he's the only only uh, prisoner to escape from Azkaban. Right, and you yeah. also have the Dementors, obviously a terrifying plot element in of themselves. Like, they can suck your soul out. That's pretty terrifying. 
Yeah, for sure. And at this stage, we don't have a lot of specific examples of Voldemort's feats of, you know, magical accomplishment. Like we know vaguely that he has killed a lot of people and he has a lot of followers, but we don't know a lot about his magical abilities, like in action, as much as we do with Sirius. So yeah, I, I, I thought he was, I thought he was a noble villain for this book on par with Voldemort for me. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it sounds like you kind of feel the same, Nathan, if you were fine with Voldemort not appearing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I completely agree. I don't, I think I really like this book just, just of that fact. And I really like Sirius Black as a character. Yeah, Sirius is a fan favorite, easy easy to love, especially once you kind of get to the end of this book. So let's kind of talk through the plot. I mean, I guess we already did massive spoilers for the book talking about Voldemort yeah. and Sirius, but yeah. I, this book was, if you don't know Harry Potter by now, like, yeah, I, I think you expect to, to just kind of go right into the conversation with the Harry Potter chat. So there will be spoilers, obviously. And when we get to the end, we're going to do our top character rankings. So top three and bottom three for how well the characters performed in the book. And let's just kind of jump right into it. So we start off at Privet Drive. Once again, Harry is under the covers doing homework. He's having an okay time at the Dursleys actually because he has access to more forms of entertainment than he's ever had in his whole life. And he's kind of turned into a teenager. He kind of mouths off at Vernon a little bit. So this is way different than the beginning of the second book, obviously, where Harry is like being locked up and Dobby comes and ruins his life. What do you guys think of this intro? Because every intro to the Harry Potter books are like slightly different twists. Yeah, yeah. I, did, I, I, mean, I like this intro. This, the third book and the first book is the only books that Harry didn't go to the, to, with the Weasleys to the burrow. And I I kind of liked it that way just because more adventures of Harry off by himself. Yeah, I felt good about Harry. You you could really you, you could tell Harry was feeling himself that he was uh, maturing a little bit that he had gained some confidence after defeating the Basilisk and whatnot. And uh, I I did feel a little bit bad for him though because Ron tried to call him and totally screws it up. Like he could have had even a more enjoyable summer if Ron was able to, you know, uh, not be so suspicious in that way. He could have had a little more interaction with his friends. Ron calls and like screams into the phone, right? And yeah, yeah. And and, and Vernon shuts it down after that. Yeah. What do you I mean, think? Actually, the... actually Ver- Vernon probably would have been able to tell that it was a magical friend calling Harry, regardless of if Ron hadn't yelled. Yeah, because Harry doesn't but... have any other friends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, what would you think of the Weasleys winning the lottery and then blowing it all on their Egypt trip? It, was that maybe not the greatest way to spend your... So, yeah, I I have a thought about that. I don't know if I should get into it now, I guess, since we're talking I think, about I it. I think now is the time. I don't okay. think we're going to talk about it later. <laughs> so, last, last pod, podcast, we talked about don't, how Domodor is affecting Carrie. Um, I feel like... Dumbledore is 100% behind the Weasleys winning the lottery and then going to Egypt. Oh, so you watched the video. I can tell you watched the video. <laughs> yeah, so I watched the video. <laughs> yeah. Steven knows what I'm talking about. So, but it's, it, I mean, it obviously makes sense. If you go back in the first book, I don't know if we talked about it in the first podcast, but the Weasleys who are, I mean, have been wizards for a long time are just randomly going to Hogwarts and asking where, like what platform they need to go to for the Hogwarts express after years of going to Hogwarts and then Harry randomly showing up. Dumbledore had to be tell him, he's like, Hey, Harry's going to be on the platform. You got it. Yeah. We did. We discussed this on the, on the book one podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Let me me fill in some, let, let me fill in some gaps here. So Nathan is referring to this video from the Super Carlin Bros YouTube channel called Dumbledore's Big Plan. They have a series of videos where they talk about how Dumbledore is really kind of orchestrating all of the movements in the background. 
And part of this is, is getting the Weasleys to befriend Harry and the Weasleys kind of act as Dumbledore's lieutenants in like monitoring Harry and making sure that Harry achieves uh, the different goals that Dumbledore has set out for him in every year. And in this year, book in, in the third year, the Prisoner of Azkaban year, uh, Dumbledore honestly doesn't do much at all. But I guess in the background, he's like trying to get Harry to uh, learn the value of life, etc. And this is kind of a theme you see with Buckbeak and with, with uh, Harry at the end, letting Peter Pettigrew live. And so, yeah, what's the deal? He, he doesn't want Harry to go to the burrow because instead he wants him to wind up at Diagon Alley. What, what was this? Yeah, so in the well, part of it also he wants to he wants them to know the value of friendship as well, and just to be happy for others and what others achieve. And so he's like the Weasleys win the lottery, whether Dumbledore fix the lottery to make them win, I don't really know. But the Weasleys, who are super poor, don't have any money to spend all their money to go to Egypt. Well, they wanted to visit and, Bill, okay. right? They hadn't seen yeah. Bill for a while. But even then, it's like Harry, like the Weasleys could have easily saved their money, you know, bought new stuff for the kids, which yeah, they seems, do. Yeah, seems, seems kind of suspicious. Honestly, I wasn't super into the Dumbledore's big plan thing for this book, but the whole thing with them going to Egypt and blowing their money doesn't seem like a good investment. Anyway, you yeah. slice it. I'm not buying Dumbledore fixing the lottery, but I am buying this being the big explanation for or you get an insight to the Weasley's money management. And now you can see maybe why they're a little bit poor because they're like Nathan <laughs> said, there's tons of other uh, better ideas that they could have spent this money. I mean, At least they get Ron a new wand. new wand. They did buy him a new wand. Yeah. yeah that's about, a relief. about time. <laughs> so Harry is unable to manage his good fortune here at Privet Drive because he blows up Marge. Marge, mm -hmm. uh, Vernon's sister, comes for a visit, really eggs Harry on, uh, very cruel, and Harry can't uh, control himself, and inadvertently his anger kind of lashes out, and, and she gets inflated, and Harry runs off and is determined to run away. But right before he's about to launch off with his broomstick, and his trunk tied to the back. He sees the Grim, which is like this wizarding uh, bad omen, this dog who's going to be important, obviously. Black dog. And then he falls down, and he, he throws his hand out, and this bus appears, this night bus appears. Very fortuitous. And Harry hops on, and they take him to, uh, they take him to Diagon Alley, to the Leaky Cauldron, where the Minister of Magic, Cornelius Fudge himself, is there waiting for Harry, and escorts him to safety, and then Harry spends the next two weeks hanging out at the Leaky Cauldron and Diagon Alley. So this is like way suspicious right off the bat, right? The fact that Fudge is involved in Harry's life. I mean, we know Harry's pretty famous, but what's going on here? Harry's being protected from something. It seems we've already had rumblings of Sirius Black. So I think it's set up pretty well to kind of like lead you into this mystery. Yeah. How fast would the book would have gone if Harry didn't trip and Sirius Black just appeared and told him everything that's going on? I had that same thought <laughs> when he was hanging outside of Privet Drive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Steven, I think that it, it sets it up really well. I also, I mean, the, we've talked about the Roald Dahl aspect that infuses itself into J.K. Rowling's writing a little bit. The Marge blowing up like a balloon took me straight back to Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory when Violet Beauregard blow, blows up like, what is it? What like fruit is it? A blueberry, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, so that made me think of that. But the night bus, like you said, extremely fortuitous. I thought that it would have been a cool alternate idea because the night bus does seem like, does it just magically appear in the wizard's time of need for other wizards too? Or does it actually well, follow a route? Or can it you be know, in like the bus? Local... The bus appears when you're on the street and you wave your wand. Yeah, which seems like are are there a lot of what do you call it when you're like hailing a taxi? Are there a lot of like false hailings? Like the night bus will show up and the wizards like actually I just had like a spasm or something, or I was doing a different spell. But anyway, I oh, thought that it would have been cool if if Harry actually because once he actually runs away, he probably has this oh crap moment 
where am I going to go now? And I think his mind, if the night bus hadn't shown up, I think logically he would have tried to use his broom to escape somewhere. And I think that that would have been a really cool scene with Harry and his broom and his trunk. And maybe there could have been like a chase scene through London on his broom. Um, Cause I didn't love the night bus. What do you, do you guys like the night bus? Yeah, it, 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 it's a little suspicious to me too, right? Like, how does this actually work? It's, it is following a route, but it also picks up wizards as soon as they stick their arm out. How does, and, and yeah, like you said, there's probably lots of false hailings. And also, don't wizards, like, what's the point of the bus? Because wizards can just apparate. So yeah, why do they need a bus? At this point, we don't know what that it's is. For all, it's for all the teenage runaway wizards. Teenage it's tailor-made for Harry's situation. I mean, they do, they do use it later in this series as well. Yeah, I, I'm not a big fan of the night bus. To be honest. It doesn't it really... Also it also introduces it's a, Stan Stumpike. Yeah, but he's like a yeah. mi- super minor. What's the point of Stan Stumpike? Yeah, well, it gives you some good back he, information later, to the serious Black. Series. Yeah, in this situation, Stan's important because he reveals more about Sirius Black. That's, here's the his, thing that's about, his only function. Here's the thing about the revelations on Sirius Black throughout this, throughout this book. That was the worst part of the book for me. Later on, there's another part where you get more Sirius Black info, and it's just like a series of different info dumps that yeah. give you more and more into Sirius, but the, I think it's done really clumsily. I'm sorry. Oh, the scene in the, the three broomsticks is, you could have done that with, so much better, but we, we can talk about that later. Also, um, before we leave Privet Drive, though, his fixation, so Harry gets his... Uh, his Hogsmeade permission slip that he has to sign before he gets back to Hogwarts. And that's the reason why he's trying to be nice to Aunt Marge is just because he's swinging a deal with Uncle Vernon so that he'll sign it, even though we know Uncle Vernon's never going to sign this thing. Uh And why I wish that they would have told us that there's a way to magically detect if someone forges a signature because it seems so obvious Obvious. to just throw a signature on there. Like, what is Harry doing? He doesn't mind breaking the rules in any other facet of life, but all of a sudden he becomes the just the the most what's the word i'm thinking of but anyway the, 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 he's he, the paragon he, of virtue here when it comes to not yeah. forging a signature apparently uh-huh yeah that's a really good point i hadn't thought of that the other thing just the permission slip in general to go to hogsmeade hog we've already talked about this in the first two podcasts yeah. hogwarts is like the most dangerous school ever that you could ever you could ever attend as a kid now yeah. in order to go to a village which appears to be like pretty safe you need an adult permission slip? Why? Well, what they're, is the... they're going off Hogwarts campus. Maybe it's just for the Shrieking Shack. Well, the Shrieking Shack is not something <laughs> students are allowed to visit it's anyway. You can't, you can't go in. Yeah the, yeah, the permission slip makes zero sense to me. Yeah, and That's... then they have, the, they have the big thing that you're supposed to feel all sentimental about when Harry finally has a guardian at the end when Sirius sends him the permission slip signed. You're supposed to uh-huh. feel all good about that and warm. So if that, and he says like, oh, this is good enough for Dumbledore. So if Sirius Black signing a permission slip is good enough for Dumbledore, why is a blank piece of paper not good enough for Dumbledore for Harry Potter? Because that's another thing that they talk, that is part of Dumbledore's big plan. Yeah, I'm not, something I'm not buying I, it. Something that I have, when I re- reread this book, I believe that Dumbledore knew that Sirius was innocent. Wait, no, say it he, one more time. He definitely does not know that. No, no, no. So Harry, Dumbledore didn't want Harry to grow up with Sirius Black because Dumbledore, being the all-powerful wizard, right, supposed to be the most powerful wizard out there, he does like Sirius doesn't even get a trial for after what happened. They just send him to Azkaban. I mean, this is a pretty... It's like a war. He maybe got like a court-martial? He didn't even get like... He didn't get anything. They just send him to Azkaban. Well, he was so obviously guilty. Dumbledore for sure doesn't know. I think that's like confirmed in the text a couple times. No, definitely definitely Dumbledore does not know. I think if you actually look into the text, you'll know that Dumbledore definitely does not know. Yeah, I 100% to think that Dumbledore uh, knew. <laughs> All right, we'll have to discuss this more in Discord because yeah. I'm like 100% uh, sure you're wrong. Yeah, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm siding with Steven on this. Dumbledore uh, for d- sure knew. Well, he didn't did- know that any of them were anim- Animaguses either. 
Oh, stumped on that one. Hey, Dumbledore, right, hey, Dumbledore yeah. doesn't know everything. He's got to know that Sirius is innocent, though. <laughs> so, did we want to move on to Diagon Alley? Cause yeah, let, let's talk some Diagon Alley. So, Harry probably uh, spends a couple of the best two weeks in his life here in Diagon Alley, right? Oh, yeah, seriously, best vacation ever. Sounds way fun. I didn't... So, like, Fudge showing up there, I didn't love because it kind of shrunk the magical world to me. Because if the Minister of Magic has enough personal time to be accessible to... I mean, it is Harry Potter, and it obviously is an important situation. But there has to be somebody else that he could send there to receive Harry Potter. I almost don't like how often Fudge shows up. Yeah, Do also, you think Fudge uh, should be more of a figurehead kind of in the background and send some, like junior person over to do his bidding yeah but that that's a super minor thing now that i think about it because that would require an, a new character to be introduced and it's fine that we get to know fudge a little bit and we get to know he's a little bit sleazy and isn't motivated by the best things all the time also if sirius black is this mass murder guy that's going after harry potter why do they let him just roam around Diagon Alley? who harry yeah, because there's there's a lot of wizarding protection around Diagon Alley, but yeah, but Sirius I, Black is mass murder. But once again, the way that Sirius Black is described, I would be scared of even if I had like three or four auras, I would not be confident in my ability to take down Sirius Black. So I don't even think it matters where Harry is. Like he yeah, escaped it, Azkaban. It, it is true. I mean, they bring in the Dementors to guard. Hogwarts. Hogwarts. But where's the protection for Harry for yeah, two weeks? Maybe maybe it would be really bad for business in Diagon Alley if there were Dementors around. So there was some kind of discussion with the local store owners, um, kind of hits at maybe some COVID-related themes that we see going on now in, in business, and they decided, no, we cannot allow Dementors. We're okay accepting the risk of serious. But what about Hogsmeade? Because that happened in Hogsmeade. Yeah, I, I, yeah, maybe Hogsmeade doesn't really get as much business anyway. It's like more of a local thing, so they don't care. I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so Harry, this two-week period in the Leaky Cauldron, I'm, I'm wondering, I'm imagining him, he goes out every single day hoping to see his friends, and he has like no idea when they're going to show up, but he has a vague idea that they are going to show up at some time. I thought that probably, seemed a little weird. Like, probably why did could they have sent him. A... Yeah, no owl. Yeah, they could have sent friends. owl to <laughs> no establish owl. a meeting time and location. Eventually, they do show up, though, and they go off. They kind of do their regular thing at Diagon Alley. They, uh, they, they look at the new Firebolt, the latest in broom technology that we kind of discussed in the previous podcast. Um, and, and this is kind of fun because, obviously, the Firebolt comes in later, but we're excited to see that. And then they the, mo the moment the moment you see the firebolt, you know that some at some point it's going to end up in Harry's, Harry's possession. Yeah, you just know. Well, I, I think Draco also could have uh, picked up a firebolt. It could have worked out that way. But they alternate who gets the broom upgrades. In book one, it was Harry. Then it was Draco in book two. Now it's Harry's turn to get another upgrade. Isn't it kind of weird that <laughs> Lucius doesn't buy the Slytherin team all firebolts after? his ability to buy them Nimbus 2001s in the previous book. I, remind me, does it ever mention how much the Firebolt is worth? Like how much it is? I thought it was like triple digits galleons. I could I look don't that remember. up. Keep, keep talking, I'll look it up. They probably have that on the Wikia somewhere. But like, yeah, it's, isn't it's a Harry, lot of galleons. like super rich? Like couldn't Harry buy it? Yeah, but he would probably have been judged really hard by his friends if he went and withdrew that many galleons and bought the Firebolt, right? Also, how did Sirius get enough money to buy it? Well, Sirius has some savings. I guess he's still got a vault. Yeah, yeah I don't know. How does he, how does he access his money? <laughs> okay. his vault. So I've looked it up, and a Firebolt costs 2,000 galleons each, which is roughly $16,000. That's... All right. That's pretty, I guess, like as a high-end broomstick, that seems pretty affordable for top-notch yeah. sports equipment. Yeah. Okay, Fireball yeah. is reasonably <laughs> priced, we've decided. Yeah, I mean, that's what they, in the Quidditch World Cup and before, that's what they, they all have. 
Well, yeah, of course, the professional teams have got the Firebolts. Their sponsors probably buy it for them. So they then, uh, the crew hops in a bunch of cars, ministry cars. They go to platform nine and three quarters. This is a little weird, too. And actually, before this happens, there's the first of the info dumps. Actually, the second, because Stan Shunpike kind of dumps some serious info. But Harry walks in on Arthur and Molly. And what, is Fudge there, too? They're discussing Sirius. And they get the, the he's at Hogwarts thing that Sirius has apparently been muttering. And Harry gets this idea that Sirius is coming after him for unknown reasons. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I just love how, and this is recurring throughout the book, but Harry is just so confident. Harry feels invincible at this point. Like, it doesn't, it feels like the people around him are more scared than he is when, uh, when Sirius, like, even when he goes straight up into the Gryffindor common room, like, Harry's n- still not even scared after that. He still ventures off into the Hogsmeade tunnel by himself and... I don't know. He's just yeah, living his he life. Just, he, he thinks took down a basilisk last year. <laughs> he's like, nothing can stop me. Yeah, Harry has a big time invincibility complex. This is nothing new. Um, but yeah, I have a, a theory for you guys that I looked up because one of my favorite parts about, well, one of my least favorite parts when they're in Diagon Alley is when. Of course, Haggard gives them a book that can eat them. That's like my least favorite part because that just stresses me out. But one of my favorite parts is when Hermione's picking out her pet. And by the way, and we're doing spoilers, obviously. So Scabbers, you know, Scabbers is Peter Pettigrew. Scabbers is everywhere in this book. Like from the first chapter, Scabbers gets so many mentions. Like they were jumping off the page to me on this reread. But I read this theory about Crookshanks and about who Crookshanks' previous owner is. Have you guys ever heard this theory? Oh, yeah, I know the theory. Yeah, so some of the fan theories say that it's Harry's old cat because Harry reads a letter from Sirius and one of, um, I can't remember when he gets a letter from Sirius, but it references the Potter's old cat. And it's interesting in the book that Crookshanks is able to identify Peter Pettigrew specifically but later in the book, she doesn't really, she's not able, or I, I calling her she for some reason, he, Crookshanks is a boy, he is not able to identify any of the other evil nefarious characters that are in disguise, like, say, Mad-Eye Moody or, like, Mundungus Fletcher when he's stealing stuff. She, but he's, like, lasered into Peter Pettigrew, which leads you to believe that he has a history with Peter Pettigrew and is able to recognize him. So and I thought that was interesting. At, also, at the end of the book, Crookshanks goes to protect Sirius at the climactic part um, when they're in the Shrieking Shack. I think Crookshanks like leaps up and lands on Sirius, lands, and she's even described as landing on Sirius's heart. So actually, yeah. this reminds me that uh, Blaster in the Past, back when these books were coming out, before all of the Harry Potter stuff was all wrapped up, my dad had this theory that Crookshanks was in fact Lily Potter in disguise. And Omega. Oh, yeah, because it's an orange cat, too. Yeah, uh-huh. that, that is written on our copy of Harry Potter in the, <laughs> in the Prince of Azkaban on, Wait, the title, on the title page. Your really? dad wrote it in as he was reading the book? I don't, I don't know who wrote he it He takes in. his notes inside the book but in the family it's, copy? It's in the book. <laughs> yeah, that could be. But um, the other thing about Crookshanks, what was I going to say? Oh, because in the Magical Menagerie, they ask how long Crookshanks has been there, and the owner says, oh, quite some time. Like, leaves it really vague, but you get the feeling that it's been, like, a long time, you know? Interesting. So maybe maybe 12 years. Could be. I'll buy it. I'm sure there's some uh, some YouTube videos supporting this. Maybe. So... Our crew at this point, I think we're ready to get on the train and go off to Hogwarts. And this train train ride is very eventful because Dementor comes on, we meet Lupin, Harry is taken down. He's affected way more than anyone else by the Dementor. But Lupin wakes up just in time to uh, send him off with a Patronus. He gives them some chocolate, which of course is the cure for Dementor attacks. Uh, They miss the sorting, unfortunately, but they do get the funny news i guess what i don't know what the word is here but it's funny that hagrid is now a teacher a professor care of magical creatures this is gonna go really well right yeah we're just already gonna start dissing hagrid i mean 
I, think I already talked hilarious. about how dumb it is that he has signed this book. Uh, also, I, I, I thought about- that Hag- Hagrid could have been good if Malfoy hadn't thrown sh- hadn't thrown salt on his game. Yeah, yeah, Hagrid's like heartbreakingly bad at teaching, right? Like you want him so much to succeed, and it's so funny and cute that he gives him the the monster book of monsters, and he doesn't realize that it's something that a regular person would find terrifying. He, yeah. he could have worked out. The way that the book is written, you get the idea that they are literally spending several months, like more than half of the year, just working with flobber worms in every class. That's all of their coursework is just working with flobber worms. Like nothing else is discussed. After he gets all depressed because of Buckbeak? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. flobber worms are boring. Hey, and the next book he brings up the blast into scroots. So he, he gets back onto his game in book four. Yeah, that's true. Every teacher, you need like a year to get your feet wet. Um, it, it doesn't really give us an idea of how good the previous teacher was. So maybe there weren't that big of shoes to fill. Maybe it's always been a subpar class. So not high expectations. But I um, going back, Stephen, to Lupin, though, uh, and the train and the Dementor, I just think that it's so cool. It's just like Lupin has so much swag just sleeping on the train and he doesn't even wake up um, when there's like students talking about him nearby. I just thought that was, that's the coolest intro for Lupin. And imagine if you're Lupin, you, you know that you're gonna be teaching. You know that Harry Potter, your, your best friends, You know, you know that you're going to be teaching and your best friend's there son. Is. Hmm? Yeah, is it going to be quiet on your end, Nathan? Yeah. Okay. Shout out to our YouTube viewers. <laughs> Raw bloopers. <laughs> Raw bloopers. Nathan maybe needs to change locations. No, no, no. It'll be quiet. <laughs> All right, sweet. So something, you're Luke. Something I do want to mention is how the Dementors only attack Terry. Uh, well, they- no, I, I, everyone felt the effects of the Dementors for sure. Harry feels it worse. And it talks about how Ginny has it really bad too, obviously, because she's remembering Tom Riddle's possession of her. Yeah, but like why? Like I Like they're on the train for Sirius, but like... I don't understand why they go around and like they just they sense vulnerability. They sense an opportunity to pray. They that we learned throughout the book that the Dementors don't have the greatest control. Yeah, the just... Dementors are not. I mean, th- these are not like good cops here. These are raw forces of, you know, th- they have a target of serious, but they don't care if they get some innocence as well. Yeah, it is true. Dumbledore does mention to Cornelius Fudge that. The Dementors, if Voldemort does come back, the Dementors are going to be the first ones that go over to his side. Yeah, and they do. So, and then one other thing on Lupin is you're Lupin. You know that you're going to go teach at Hogwarts. You know you're going to come face to face with Harry, who's your best friend's son. You're sleeping on the train, and bam, you wake up, and here, here he is. Here's the dude that you've probably been thinking about seeing for some time now, and you're able to just nonchalantly protect him with the Patronus. Yeah, definite swag. I like it, Dan. Yeah, Lupin is an expert on keeping his cool, just in general. Yeah, and then throughout the year that he teaches Harry, this special patronum just takes care of him and everything. Yeah, they have some good moments for sure. So the term begins, and kind of like I said, this book follows more of like, here we go from class to class. So it's fun in that way. So at the beginning, we have a divination class with Trelawney, and you realize how uh, kind of out of the box this class is going to be. Hermione immediately dismisses it uh, because it's not the, the logical class that she is used to. There's no real theory that she can study, and we get yeah. our first Carry of Magical Creatures class with the Hippogriff in- incident. But yeah, Dan, you have a divination thought? Oh yeah, I have tons of divination thoughts, but like regarding Hermione's reaction to the divination class, I'm wondering where this like instant disrespect and disregard was at in the previous year with Lockhart. She was just so hormonal and following her heart that she 
was just totally blind to Lockhart's ineptitude, but she sees right through Trelawney from the beginning. Well, we can we can yeah. discuss if it's seeing through. Like, obviously, there's something real to Trelawney. Well, well, so maybe with Lockhart, she learned her lesson in book two. That, yeah, come, that's a good she's point. She's come back in book three. Yeah. Yeah, that and she's taking like twelve different classes. Yeah, so it's hinted right away, and this is something that is in your face, this mystery of what is Hermione doing here? She's completely burning herself out, and she has like three classes scheduled at every different period, and no one knows how it's happening. So it's an open mystery, and yeah, right away, we look at Hermione's schedule, and it doesn't make sense. Yeah, and I think it's cool how it ties in with everything else at the end of the book, because as you're reading, I don't think that you're devoting as much of your... Um, mental faculties to this mystery because there are other way more pressing concerns that you're trying to theorize what's going on and in the back of your mind you know that there's this weird thing like Hermione's taking a lot of classes because she's such a nerd but at least me I don't know about you guys but I like I didn't care about it that much but it was cool how it tied in at the end all the same this this is uh the mention of we do get mention of some classes that I've always kind of been more interested in, like Arithmancy, and I think there's a study of runes, or ancient runes or something. Yeah. These, uh -huh. these classes seem really interesting. Yeah, I wish so. We got to learn more about them. So let's talk Hippogriff incident. Oh. oh, wait, wait, but divination anyway. So the description of the divination room up in the tower, you got to love that, right? Just seems like a way chill place. Like maybe a good place to cast some of the, what's the spell that they talk about in this book that basically the result is like your high. It's like the cheering spell, the cheering yeah, the, charm. The, the cheering charm, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I could see some, some of the slack off wizards just hanging out, sneaking to the divination room and just lounging about and casting the cheering charm to pass the hours. So it's the hippie yeah. room. <laughs> the yeah, hippie it's, room. I, it's totally the hippie room. I'm wearing my uh, Bill Walton hippie shirt today. I guess you can't quite see it on the video, <laughs> yeah. but that, yeah, it works out. Okay. <laughs> but I, so, I, do love, I do love how every classroom has its own distinct environment that kind of matches the teacher's personality as well as the course material. I think that's a really cool touch that um, J.K. Rowling adds to this so that not every classroom is uh, the same cookie cutter feel. Yeah, that makes sense. I guess I never really thought about that, but yeah, that's another nice layer. I mean, Snape teaches in the dungeons. Uh, what, are the other classrooms described like that? I picture Transfiguration and Charms being kind of like typical classrooms. Yeah, yeah. that's- Same with Defense Against the Dark Arts. It's kind of hard to picture them separate than the movies too. Yeah, I'm totally just picturing the movies. So moving past divination, I guess we may have some more thoughts later with some later classes that come up. But Care of Magical Creatures, class number one, is going really well until Malfoy fouls it up as usual and gets injured by the hippogriff. But the whole hippogriff plot line, the whole thing, it doesn't make any sense, right? Like, we, we talked about how dangerous Hogwarts is. This is an advanced dangerous creature that has injured a student that was obviously antagonizing it and we've got a whole class of witnesses it doesn't make any sense how this is a thing so what, what's yeah. going on here like is there any defense for this hippogriff plot line yeah okay. so i i go back to the to dumbledore trying to teach harry the value of life by <laughs> getting him killed thing dumbledore could have easily easily stopped this trial and stopped from Buckbeak from dying, but he didn't because he wanted Harry to understand the meaning of life. But what about Buckbeak actually being a part of the Care of Magical Creatures class? We, so that, and also, does Hagrid, like, if I didn't know better, I would think Hagrid was like a double agent to get Harry injured. Because does he think that Harry is immortal or something? Like, he, he picks Harry to be the guinea pig to try it out for the first time. And I, like he has a lot of confidence in Harry's ability, and to his credit, he pulls it off flawlessly, of course. So the class up to the end kind of makes sense. With, so Hagrid's going in. He's, he chooses a creature that he thinks is cool. 
he doesn't recognize how dangerous it is. And so the class gets going and he's like, oh man, this is going really badly because the hippogriff is hostile. The students are all afraid. So he says, okay, Harry, you're my friend. Help me out here. He's like <laughs> clutching at straws, right? Like someone help me. So he picks Harry. Harry comes forward and saves the day, right? He bows, the hippogriff respects him. He goes off on the hippogriff ride. It's fun. We're all feeling good. And then of course, Malfoy messes it all up. That all makes sense to me. It's just the trial afterwards and everything about Malfoy being injured. That doesn't make any sense because that should have been shut down so fast. Yeah, yeah you, get, you get kind of an insight into the Wizarding World hierarchy and how much power Lucius Malfoy is, or has in the Malfoy family in general. Because, yeah, you're right. It doesn't make any sense that something this minor would have such drastic results. And, like, that it would require – going back to Fudge, like, Fudge shows up at the trial, which is, like, it's just a hippogriff. Don't you have other things to be doing? Right. It's like if Adam Silver was personally involved in every NBA player suspension or something. Yeah. Going back to the theory that Dumbledore could have stopped it. Yeah, I think Dumbledore could have stopped it. But sometimes, I, I don't know about this theory thing. I think maybe this was more just a plot device that happened. And I don't think it was one of the stronger ones. I mean, I don't think these books are perfect. We like the books, but I think there are some weaknesses. And the whole Buckbeak plot line was a little weak. For me yeah and if you weren't if you weren't sold on draco just being a a total loser at this point i don't know what to tell you <laughs> after this whole buckbeak thing because he's willing to sacrifice basically his entire reputation right like the hogwarts students have to be able to see through his fake injury and they have to be whispering behind his back like oh there's the guy that's faking an injury for three months just to get this the new care of magical creatures teacher fired or in trouble um i don't know i feel like that's a big hit to his reputation well that is draco's <laughs> reputation right like no one really yeah. likes him and the slytherins like you kind of said in a previous podcast dan are just pure evil so they're fine with it <laughs> they all hate haggard they're like go draco, <laughs> go so, draco. from one villain to another Let's get some Snape action. So next we have a potions yeah. class with Snape where he terrorizes Neville Longbottom for no apparent reason. And then in the very next scene, we go to Defense Against Dark Arts with our bog art lesson. And this is kind of like heartbreaking when Neville says my greatest fear is Snape. But then yeah. you, get, you really love Lupin who kind of cheers up Neville and he helps Neville turn Snape into, uh, you, you know, like a, a funny version wearing his grandmother's clothing. And then the whole Bogart sequence happens uh, up until Harry, who's ready to go, but Harry's pulled back at the last moment and Lupin takes down, d d deals the finishing blow to the Bogart. So yeah, this was probably the best defense against the Dark Arts class we've had yet. An actual lesson has been taught successfully. Probably the best class period, right? Of any yeah. of the subjects. I mean, I, I'm That's guessing like we had some really good transfiguration classes though. Well, I'm just saying the ones that are described from the sample that we have to work with. I think because being a teacher myself, I mean, hats off to Lupin. Like this has every aspect of a successful lesson. You have full engagement from every class member. Every class member is able to feel success, is engaging and participating. Well, except Harry, ironically. Harry is the one that doesn't get to have success. But this is I couldn't imagine a better debut for Lupin. And they master a new spell in like one class period. Yeah, it doesn't appear to be that hard of a spell. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or it, useful. Like, when are they going to use that spell after the yeah. class? Yeah, very true. Like, this <laughs> spell is just for Bogarts. Is there a spell for every other uh, rogue enemy animal as or enemy creature as well? Yeah, I don't know. At least they learn a new one. They don't learn that many spells successfully, to be honest. Do Bogarts show up anywhere else in the series? I can't remember. Um, well, I, in the second movie of the, oh, what's it? Uh, the Magical last book? Creatures? No. Oh, uh, the, oh. oh, the new yeah. series. Yeah, the, the new it, series. The Newt the Scamander fan, series. What's it called? The, yeah, Fantastic, Fantastic Beasts. Beasts. Yeah, yeah, Fantastic Beasts in the second movie. And don't Professor Dumbledore is teaching that exact same lesson. 
Man, I'm oh. sorry, but I, I don't really care about those movies. <laughs> it's not, hey, I like, it's not really Harry Potter for me. An interesting thing, though, when they get rid of the monster book that Hagrid assigns, I think the book that they use in that class from that point forward is written by Newt Scamander, right? Probably. It's probably, is it so, not Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them? Like, that's probably the text <laughs> of the book. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I, think there I didn't are, know that. I think there are Bogarts later in the series, but I don't remember the exact details. Probably a minor thing. They don't so, play a major role, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So the spell was not actually that useful. But next thing that happens, we go forward to Halloween, where Harry misses his first Hogsmeade trip. He hangs with Lupin a bit, and he sees Lupin get a potion from Snape, which seems suspicious, because, of course, we always suspect, suspect Snape for everything that goes wrong. And then at the end of this sequence, Sirius Black is in Hogwarts. He slashes up the fat lady portrait, and we get a sense of how dangerous Sirius is because he's stuck into the castle. Yeah. And we get some of the coolest magic that Dumbledore has used up to this point, which is instantly producing sleeping bags for the entire student body for just this <laughs> way fun sleepover. <laughs> way fun In the sleepover. Great Hall. I think it so should be, I think they should have done it more often to celebrate different things. The, just the co-ed sleepover. <laughs> yeah, pro probably a lot of a, uh, probably a lot of uh, nefarious behavior attempted here that uh, prefects had and head boys had to put down. Yeah, I wish yeah, we would have gotten. I wish we would have gotten some comedy with maybe featuring Fred and George, and Lee Jordan or something. Yeah, Fred and George probably would have been you know sneaking over to some girl to try to, you know, have, have let's, a fun. Let's keep it PG. Let's keep it PG. <laughs> Hey, hey, we, we all, this is, this is in the midst of the entire Great Hall. Nothing too bad is happening, of course. And this, yeah. But, I mean, yeah, like you say, it, it could be funny. But I think that's the safest place that if I was a student, I would have been terrified out of my mind. But you feel a little bit of security being surrounded by people, even if they're just like students that wouldn't know the first thing about defending themselves from Sirius Black. Because there's, there's like strength in numbers. You yeah. think it's interesting how heavily Hogwarts is defended in this book compared to how lightly Hogwarts was defended from a basilisk in the previous book. Like, that's a little suspicious, right? Because yeah. they didn't know about the basilisk and it was already in the school. Yeah, but students were literally being petrified. Where was the sleepover then? There was nothing. There was no protection. Yeah. Wait, now that I think about it, though, crowding... A bunch of students into the great hall might not have been the best thing because the thing that Sirius Black is most famous for was is destroying a, a crowd a crowd of people <laughs> so maybe he's mastered the spell that you have to have a concentrated group and it yeah just but he knocks all he, of them out Sirius doesn't have a wand well they don't know that do they Yeah, yeah I, I, know. Know. I would just think so. <laughs> did you did your phone think we said Siri? No, <laughs> my <laughs> my iPad. Oh. <laughs> Serious black. All right, so yeah, I don't remember Sirius's wand status exactly, but the next thing that happens is uh, oh, we have a replacement portrait for the fat lady, Sir. What's his name? Cadigan. Cadigan. Yeah. Cadigan. Yeah. 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 Funny character. Add some humor. Yeah. He's pretty and, funny. He gives you a little bit of an insight to what the portrait character is, that you can have a diversity of personalities. Yeah. Yeah, I just think it, he changes the password every, like, week. <laughs> yeah, f funny times. And then our next thing, Quidditch goes on. So Quidditch goes on, but unfortunately, Gryffindor loses their first match to Hufflepuff, and we get, like, a, an emotional Oliver Wood speech because he really wants to win the, world, the, the House Cup, and they never have Gryffindor but they lose to Hufflepuff because the Dementors show up in force and Harry falls off his broom and his broom is destroyed and Dumbledore comes out and he's super mad at all the Dementors for, for coming on and affecting all the students. So, uh, yeah, what would you guys think of Quidditch uh, here? Uh, this is kind of some exciting action. So were yeah. the Dementors, do we assume that the Dementors were in the area because they were seeking Sirius Black or they, they saw him? I think they just got yeah. excited because of all the emotions around the Quidditch match, and they were yeah. like trying to trying to feed. Mm -hmm. 
That and we get our first look into Cedric Diggory, who's on the Hufflepuff team. Yeah, and Cho Chang in the next match. But I didn't have. I I thought that the, the, the Dementor showing up here were good because we needed more of a catalyst for Harry starting the the Patronus lessons and developing his relationship with Lupin. So I I thought this was good and it w- it was nice that um that. Gryffindor actually lost a Quidditch match. That was kind of refreshing for me. Like in a sports movie, it's always good to have the favorite team occasionally lose so that the winning feels sweeter. But it was also very sweet that it did not happen because Harry screwed up. Well, you know, within his control. Yeah. So, yeah, did Harry Potter ever actually lose a match that he was able to play 100% in? I'm trying to remember. I don't know. I, I don't You'd think have to he fact ever did. check that. I, I don't think he ever did. So speaking of Lupin, next thing that happens is Harry gets the Marauder's Map, which is one of the funnest pieces of Hogwarts Harry Potter magic. Um, he uses it to go off to sneak into Hogsmeade, of course. As soon as he's got the map, he's going to break some rules with it. And this is one of the worst parts of the book when he gets this ridiculous info dump on Sirius Black when he just uh, when oh. he spies on Rosemerta and McGonagall and Hagrid and maybe someone else having a conversation. And they're just like, they should know all of this stuff about Sirius already, but purely for Harry's benefit and the plot's benefit, they're like, oh, tell me about Sirius Black. No way. He was friends with James Potter. And blah, blah, blah. Like, this doesn't make any oh, sense. Yeah. But yeah, this was well, not a how- perfect book. I, yeah, it's for sure imperfect. How else? Because I was trying to think of different ways that Harry could have found out about this thing. Um, I was thinking maybe like Hagrid could have slipped up the information in one of their meetings. Because um, Hagrid's obviously in the know. He's in this conversation in the Three Broom Six, which is a little weird to me, but that's besides the point. But I don't know. I was trying to think of alternate ways, and I guess J.K. Rowling just couldn't think of a, a better solution. Because yeah. Harry has to know this stuff at some point. Or maybe Lupin tells him or something. Yeah, any anyone could have told him, which really would have been an info dump for anyone. But this conversation, just the way that it went down, where it, all the characters seemed to be so oblivious to the information and they were learning it for the first time, didn't make sense because for a character who is so infamous, Sirius Black, he's like Voldemort's right-hand man, he killed all these people. Like social media, wizard social media should have been going crazy about this we should have been getting refresher podcasts on Sirius Black there's no way that this is the first time people are realizing and remembering everything that Sirius you know everything that went on with Sirius when he was in school information travels slower in the magical world Stephen they have newspapers still no one did an expose newspaper report Um, like the the Daily Prophet didn't report this information well they don't get the Daily Prophet at at Hogwarts. There's no current events class. Why didn't Malfoy learn the information and rub it in Harry's face? Because he's getting owls from his parents who actually love him. Well, I, that's actually debatable. Um, here's a thought I just had. So Dobby, Dobby could have been a part of this book. And come to think of it, why was Dobby so concerned about Harry Potter's life in the second book? But not in this was it book. wasn't there to warn Harry at all in the third book because Harry Dobby had to know about Sirius Black through his elfish underground communication system, and he's free now, so he can easily go to Privet Drive. He knows exactly where it is. <laughs> he could show up at any time. Yeah, Dobby's just not a plot element, and this is how the Harry Potter books operate. Where within one book, something's really important, then it kind of disappears for future books. This is the book all about hippogriffs and time turners and. Sirius Black and just, you know, all these kind of different, uh, you know, Hogsmeade, obviously, but things like Dobby and things that were important in previous books are just kind of absent. That's how it works. Can we also, can we also talk about how Harry convinced Lupin to teach him Expecto Patronum? Like, yeah, the yeah, he, worst possible reason. What do you mean? He, he tells him that he wants to learn it so he can defend himself while playing Quidditch. Well, that's a totally legitimate reason because he just fell off his broom while playing Quidditch. 
Yeah, Harry has no reason to believe that his protection and safety is going to be a priority in a Quidditch match. He knows that he's going to have to fend for himself. Well, he was just told that Dumbledore is, like, because it tells them that Dumbledore got mad at the Dementors and they're not going to go on to the Hogwarts grounds as much. So why? If I was, if I was Harry, why would I believe that Dumbledore is really protecting me at all? I've been in mortal danger my first two years and I've already <laughs> been put in mortal danger again in my next year. Because you gotta, yeah. you gotta fend for yourself. What, well, it is it is a question. Doing. I agree with you, Nathan. It is a question. Why can't any of the other trained wizards or witches in the stands? Why can't they cast a Patronus? Because um, yeah. they're able to see the Dementors coming just as easily as Harry, who's actually participating in the game. So maybe just a staff member patrolling the grounds to make sure, and the best Patronus caster could be doing that. Yeah, Lupin should maybe be doing it since he seems to be pretty good at those. Patronuses. But I also think that the Dementors are super, super important for Harry because we find out that his fear is fear itself and he's not used to being scared of anything really. So he immediately wants to correct this personality flaw that he's found in himself. Yeah. Deep. Very deep. Thank you. <laughs> I don't, I don't have any prepared thoughts on that. But yeah, Harry is definitely growing as a character. And that, that's a good way to sum it up. He, he really um, learns to be more courageous in this book. I mean, he gets more and more courageous every book. That's kind of who Harry is. But he also um, is maybe more merciful as well, especially towards the end. So he gets a new broom. He, he gets the firebolt, finally. We knew it was going to happen. He gets it, but under kind of weird circumstances. And it's taken away because... They suspect that Sirius sent it. They're right. Hermione's right. But, I mean, it wasn't really jinxed or anything like that. It was a legitimate gift. So we get more info on the Dementors and Sirius from Lupin. He starts to teach Harry Patronuses. Scabbers disappears. Ron and Hermione have a falling out over Crookshanks. Kind of a ridiculous argument. Um, I guess Ron, I mean, maybe not so ridiculous. Like, Ron loves his dad. (laughs) But... Yeah, I don't know. I just think that every time Ron and Hermione argue, it's annoying to me. They're just flirting. No, 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 no. Ron, I mean, he does have a valid argument because he did find blood with orange hair next to his bed. Yeah, I think so. that I would be, I, I can see both sides, but Hermione is extremely dismissive of Ron's pleadings with her to to keep her murderer cat away. And even though Ron obviously like doesn't care about scabbers, like if you're telling someone repeatedly to do something and by their actions, you can tell that what you're requesting is not important at all. And then the worst of what could happen actually does happen. Like Crookshanks does end up supposedly murdering scabbers at the time is what they thought. Like I would, I could see myself being pretty mad about that. And I'll backtrack a little bit. I think maybe Ron does have a legitimate beef, but the, the arguments just, all these arguments are, are frustrating. Also, me. if I was Scabbers or Peter Pettigrew, and I knew that Sirius Black was around to come and, like, kill him, it's like, I would just leave. Like, uh, why is he sticking around? That's true. Sirius does always know that he's going to be with Ron. I hadn't thought about that, but... I don't know. He's at risk wherever he goes. There's lots of people looking for him. Yeah, he's kind of a coward as well. No, well, no, well, no one knows that he's alive besides Sirius Black. Yeah, but I think he's right. just hesitant to strike it out on his own, too. He's been hiding as a rat for the past 14, 13 years. So he's a little cowardly. 12, 12 years. Yeah. Eh, they're 13. They're 13 years um, old. But yeah, okay, 12, but, you're right, because Harry was a year old. Yeah. Another another thing though, speaking of serious of people being scared of Sirius Black, what did you guys think about Harry wanting to go after Sirius Black? Because I just thought that that was so ridiculous, just a total kamikaze mission I, I from what could, we knew I at mean, that point. I could see the reason behind it, just that Harry wants revenge, but he thinks that Sirius betrayed his parents. He but yeah, but, revenge behind that. But Expelliarmus again, can only get you so far, Harry. 
Right. Harry has this invincibility <laughs> complex, which is kind of at odds with what you were talking about, Dan, where his only fear is fear of the Dementors, right? Like he's afraid of being afraid, yet he is yeah. super, you know, negligent of his <laughs> safety and wanting to take on Sirius Black when he would surely lose. Yeah, I thought that that was just so dumb that Ron and Hermione had to talk Harry off of going after and trying to challenge this accomplished wizard that escaped Azkaban to a duel. It just, yeah. It, it, it was a serious flaw in Harry's character for me. But I, I guess all true heroes have to have a little bit of crazy in them. Yeah, no doubt. Harry, especially in, in these scenes. Willing to take a risk. So next things that happen, we pick up a win. We pick up a W against Ravenclaw. And one of my favorite moments uh-huh. from the book happens here when Harry is able to successfully use Expecto Patronum on Dementors at the Quidditch match. But they're not Dementors. It's actually Draco and Crab and Goyle and Marcus Flint, his Slytherin cronies. So this was really funny because at the end of the match, Harry like looks down and he sees, or Lupin says, hey, look over there. And, and they see like Draco and them struggling in their Dementor costumes. And Harry's really got the upper hand. And anytime Harry picks up the W against Malfoy, you're especially gratified as a reader. <laughs> yeah, in this section, I just have my notes just say in all caps, Malfoy get a life now. <laughs> Malfoy gets He's just now. the saddest character. <laughs> I think Malfoy's just jealous of Harry, of all the treatment that he's getting at Hogwarts. Because you got to think when Malfoy's at his house, he gets whatever he wants, right? Yeah, Malfoy's super jealous. We kind of talked about this in the first two. I know, Dan, you're, you're really strong on this point where Malfoy's just obsessed with Harry. It's kind of sad. And his father kind of berates him for Harry and Hermione doing better than him. You see this in, uh, in, in uh, the second year at Nocturne Alley. So, yeah, Malfoy, hmm, really kind of a, a very despicable and sad character. Yeah, he so just desperately wants to make his parents proud. And they've indoctrinated him in this anti-mudblood, um, pure wizard bias. And he's just hell-bent on carrying that out in any circumstance. I don't know. Um, but going to the Quidditch, so do you guys, so Cho Chang in this, I love talking about the Quidditch. Uh, Cho Chang's strategy in this book, terrible. Previously, previously, I was a massive Cho Chang fan, right? Hottest girl at Hogwarts. Sure. You, <laughs> yeah. So her strategy okay. in this is terrible. So she's tailing Harry because um, apparently Harry has like better eyesight than her and being able to see the snitch. And she hopes that when she's going to be clued into where the snitch's location, the moment Harry will be, and she's going to try to follow him. Problem. Harry has the firebolt. I'm not going to catch Harry once he has his eyes on the snitch. I don't know, really disappointed in Cho Chang in this, in this match. Yeah, I would say Penelope Clearwater, I think, is hotter just based off of description and cool uh, cool names. But, yeah, Cho's strategy is way bad. I, what is she writing, like a Comet 360 or something? Is she even on a Nimbus? Yeah, she's on like some that. trashy broom, yeah, probably. Well, yeah, compared a, to the Firebolt. It's a way bad strategy, and it doesn't – I mean, she gets destroyed. Wait, so yeah. you like Penelope Clearwater, but she's with Percy, right? Who's, like, obviously the biggest dork. Yeah, that maybe that's a maybe that's a flaw, but in terms of I mean just pure hotness, you know. Do you just think she's seeking status with the head boy? Yeah, that yeah. that makes sense. Kind of an airhead, did see blonde maybe. But she's in Ravenclaw. She's not an airhead. Hmm. Okay, I'm not really. Yeah. I don't know. Percy probably okay. has some redeemable qualities. Actually, there's another theory that Percy had a time turner in his third and fourth year. Because he has 12 OWLs, which is only possible if you take a lot of the, whatever you, the extra classes, the elective classes. Just some, some that I've heard before. Mm. That Percy's actually a really accomplished Hogwarts student. Like he didn't get the head boy status for, for nothing. That makes sense. I mean, Hermione's probably not the only student to have ever received time turner permission. Yeah. From McGonagall. So next thing that happens, we get more serious action because he has a knife on Ron in the middle of the night. Ron wakes up screaming bloody murder. That Sirius is, uh, is right there with a the knife. Ron immediately gets like celebrity status because of this. 
and we find out that Neville, it's, it's Neville's fault because he like let, let his uh, password sheet drop. Actually, that might not be, that reveal might not be for a little bit later, but um, what did you guys think of kind of Ron using the serious, uh, the serious attack to become a celebrity? I thought it was way obnoxious. Yeah. But that's just me. I mean, I have a huge bias when it comes to Ron. I, I do not like him as a character. Yeah, we, we know you're jealous of Ron's relationship with Hermione and don't like Ron because of that reason. No, I, I don't like Ron because of other reasons that happened in later books. So I guess I will say it makes a little bit of sense that he used his celebrity status here because Ron has always been overlooked. And so if people are finally paying him some attention... Like, it, it's natural, right? You're 13, and you're like, yeah, man, I, I, let's tell my war story over and over again. So I can't fault him too much, I guess. Um, we talked in a previous podcast about the parallels between the Malfoy family and the Weasley family, mm-hmm. how they're, like, the good and evil foils of each other. And Malfoy and Ron, in this respect, are pretty similar to me because – they just need that validation and they're willing to stoop to whatever lows to get some attention. Just a thought. So now Harry goes back to Hogs- Hogsmeade again, this time wearing the invisibility cloak, but he slips up when he's praying, uh, playing pranks on Draco. And I think Draco like sees his disembodied, he- disembodied head floating around Hogsmeade. He rushes back to try to, uh, you know, have an alibi, but unfortunately he runs into Snape who continues his vendetta against Harry and has a little bit of a stand-up. They find the map. Snape starts to use the map. There's kind of a funny moment where, uh, where, where Padfoot prongs Mooney and Wormtail insults Snape through the map. And then Lupin comes in and saves them. Um, Ron also kind of shows up. This is kind of funny, but at the same time, like really renews your hatred in, in Malfoy and Snape. And then you yeah. also learn that Buckbeak has lost his case and there's going to be some more things here. So what do you guys think of the whole uh, Hogsmeade Snape uh, Marauder's Map incident? Yeah. So Snape, Snape has a lot of really annoying moments in this book, right? Like Snape kind of sucks. Like when he takes over for Lupin's class and he is obviously trying to clue them in that he's a werewolf. And uh, yeah. what's the moment? Like Hermione's answering a question or she's raising her hand to answer a question and he's asking everyone else nobody knows it and Hermione just says it and then he like instantly scolds her he has some really some really low moments nothing surprising though from from Snape but I was pretty heartbroken when the Marauders map got taken away like the Marauders map is one of my favorite parts certainly in this book but like in the series in general the Marauders map is so cool and it's easy to see yourself as a student and think how fun it would be to have an item like this. So you love that Harry has it and he can use it for all the right reasons. And at least it got taken away by Lupin, right? If it got taken by yeah. Snape, that oh, would yeah, really seem yeah. dominus, but Lupin, you figure you're getting it back at some point. True. Do you remind me, is it here or is it later where Harry tells Lupin that the map doesn't work? What do you mean? I don't he tells think he, him it doesn't work. He, he tells Snape that, not Lupin. No, no, no. He tells someone that it because Peter Pet he finds Peter Pettigrew on the map. Oh yeah, he's like Peter Pettigrew's dead, but I see yeah. him on the map. Mm-hmm. No, that and doesn't happen. That doesn't happen until they don't see. There's no. Um, but Harry, Harry doesn't have the map anymore until like the very end of the book. Yeah, and Lupin's the one that sees Peter Pettigrew. Harry never identifies Peter Pettigrew. Yeah, that's true. And that that's kind of like an open, actually, yeah, that reminds me, that is an open issue with the book. Harry should have been able to see the marking of Peter Pettigrew next to Ron. Yeah. Yeah, that is they true, do, but... They do do it in the movie. I think that, oh, that is true. They do do it in the movie, but I'm willing to kind of overlook that plot hole that Fred and George at least should have seen P- Peter Pettigrew or wondered who was with Ron this whole time. I mean, cause the Marauders map is so cool. And the end of the book is so cool that I'm willing to sacrifice that one element of reality. I'm kind of, I'm willing to overlook that. 
you have to suspend belief a little bit here to read about a book of wizards at a school, right? <laughs> right. I, I think what I was thinking about before with Snape taking something away from Harry is that he loses the invisibility cloak, which was equally devastating to me. Like how could, like losing the invisibility cloak, it's, it's your number one, it's your number one, uh, what am I trying to say? It's number one <laughs> in your arsenal, right? You always yeah. need the invisibility cloak. It's your yeah. go-to. For yeah. sure. I mean, he does so, get it back. Yeah, he, he gets this. I mean, he's always going to get his stuff back at the end. We can't, we can't lose anything too important. So next, Hermione has a nice moment where she slaps Draco after a particularly bad care of magical creatures class. And then she quits divination. So Hermione's like at her wit's end oh, yeah. here with having yeah. friend problems and putting in 20-hour days on the schoolwork and probably never sleeping, although she should have been able to use the time turner to sleep. sleep. So that's weird that she's sleep deprived. But right. whatever. Um, there's always problems with time travel. You can never complain too much about this. So Hermione, really strong sequence for her. Yeah, I love this part for Hermione. And I love the contrast between her and like the other female Gryffindor characters, like Parvati and Lavender, how they just worship Professor Trelawney, but Hermione's too smart for that. Yeah, the yeah. other characters, the other female characters are just kind of caricatures. They don't really get defined at all until some of the later books. So next, uh, Gryffindor wins. They're quitted. They, they win everything, right? They, they defeat Slytherin in the huge yeah. match. This is what, we, what uh, we've all been waiting for. They have to, Harry can't catch Snitch until they're at least 50 points up because of their previous loss, but they're able to do that. And even though Draco has another poor moment, openly cheating, like grabbing Harry's broom. Harry yeah. still, he, he still <laughs> prevails. Do you like how Slytherin had such little confidence in their team that they pulled their regular rotation and inserted the all muscles and like maul and brawl team? Like their only hope was just to injure the Gryffindor players. But uh -huh. to be fair, like let's have this discussion right now. Best Gryffindor Quidditch team ever, Harry's third year. No. True or false? Tell me I'm wrong. Like I Oliver mean, Wood, Oliver Woods false. last year. What's false. a better year? I mean, they lost a game though, right? That would be the argument against. Oh, it's just the it's the Dementors though. Harry's sixth year. Maybe they could have caught the snitch sooner to avoid the Dementor issue. I don't think you can blame that on Harry. If the Dementors hadn't shown up, I have no doubt Harry's catching the snitch Harry, before Cedric Diggory Harry, in that Harry's, game. Harry's sixth year. I'm saying you have this lineup is stacked. You have so much experience. You have the chemistry of Fred and George on the beaters. Like they have those the twin senses. They always know where each other are. The chasers have had multiple years of experience together to know to adapt to each other's style of play. And then you have the the captain, Oliver Wood, right? Best keeper in the school at this point. He has to be. And by the way, I th I think I relate so much to Oliver Wood in this book because every time he makes an appearance all he wants to talk about is winning quidditch at at all costs like he does not care about the mortal threat of Sirius black looming on cam on campus at all like he does not care about harry's life he just cares about bringing the cup home uh -huh, i love uh -huh. that about oliver wood probably doesn't care about any of his classes either <laughs> um, yeah nathan there's no way the 60 year team is better because harry's not even on that team yeah he is no he's not he gets he gets cat banned by umbridge that's fifth year mm, is it six years the weasley yeah. is king yeah but harry doesn't play because he he is not even there for the final match Ginny's the seeker yeah but he's still on the team he's a seeker until the final match mm, no that's too Debatable. many asterisks for me it's all about the third year team yeah, you, you got to have Harry Potter on the team to be the best team ever. Harry's He's the best the seeker. He's on the team in six years. Doesn't make, doesn't make it into the final game. There's only three games <laughs> in the Quidditch season. You can't miss any games. <laughs> He's on the team. He's the captain. Why aren't there more games, by the way? It doesn't seem like it's that much of an effort to get a game going. Uh, well, when players nearly get injured every game, I think you want to limit that exposure. Yeah, f fair enough. Maybe uh, it's just too much to write about multiple games in the course of a Harry Potter novel. So yeah, let's, in, in let's this move book, on, though. 
Wait, wait, wait. Can I just say one thing? In this game, I realize that J.K. Rowling, she has to write about the Quidditch. But do you guys ever feel like you don't really care about the Quidditch? Like you just really want to kind of skim that part and get back to the main plot lines? I felt like that in this book. Like I didn't really care about the Slytherin match. I could see if I wasn't a sports person, I would feel that way because yeah. it's definitely very disparate. You, from but you gotta care about the last match. I mean, it's for the it's for the cup. You gotta care about the championship. I just figured Gryffindor was gonna win and Harry was gonna be heroic. <laughs> yeah, well, and yeah, and the plot line doesn't weave into the rest of what's going on super well. Like maybe Quidditch could have been involved a little bit more, but it's. It's a fun, integral part of the school year. And like I said, this is kind of the book where you start to have like classes and Quidditch be like, you, you get more of like an everyday look into Hogwarts, uh, different than the previous books. So next things that happen are our final exams. So I don't think we've really seen final exams previously. First book had maybe some final exams. I don't actually remember, but you actually see Harry go through several of the exams. The most important one is the divination exam when Trelawney actually has this seemingly real prediction, like this real uh, yeah. foresight, and it's a little bit and, creepy. And a uh, little bit. That part is so freaky. Yeah, <laughs> I remember. I remember reading that book when I was a kid, and I was. T I could not get. I had to go to the bathroom really bad. I was like reading before going to bed, and I was. T I was way too scared to get up and go down the the dark hallway. I thought that was a cool part. So I was creeped out by the second book when I was a kid. Sounds like the third book really did it for you. Um, and and Trelawney <laughs> says that Voldemort's servant is returning and he's going to bring the Dark Lord back. And Harry assumes this is serious, serious. right? We, yeah. and, and the reader would assume that as well up to this yeah. point. So it's, yeah, it's, it's really well done. well done for sure. So now our gang goes off to support Hagrid at the execution. And this is where the climax starts to really take off. And I think we can just kind of talk through um, the, the climax, we're all probably familiar with these events. So Buckbeak is supposedly killed, right? Um, yeah. But before we can really see what's happening there, Scabbers appears again in Hagrid's hut and runs off. And so Ron runs off to get Scabbers and Gang runs off to help Ron. But then the Grim comes up and bites Ron, breaks his leg, drags him down under the Whomping Willow into the yeah, Shrieking a, Shack. A really far distance, by the way. Yeah, Ron had a, a yeah. yeah pretty rough yeah. go. Here go. It's, it's one of Ron's better moments, though, Nathan. Yeah, Ron really no. shines here. He has some heroic moments later on, operating with the broken leg. Very impressive. So they, they all end up at the Shrieking Shack, and we get the big reveal. So we learn all yeah. about that. You know, uh, we learn all about Sirius and James and Remus and Peter at school. We learn that Sirius has been framed, that Pettigrew was behind everything. And right as this is kind of, right as we're learning all of these things, Snape appears. He throws off the invisibility cloak that he's picked up. And Harry and Ron and Hermione attack him. They hit him with the yeah. triple disarm and yeah, knock so him cool. unconscious. Yeah. They attack a teacher. And Hermione's freaked out. She's like, oh, crap, we attacked a teacher. <laughs> Harry and Ron don't seem to care too much. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no. Yeah, I just want to say the end of this book is so riveting. I kind of alluded to this earlier, but the consensus kind of on this third book, it's most people's favorites or like close to favorite. And most of that is because of these last few chapters. Like it's so masterful. It's so exciting. And I love twists and surprise endings. And this book is just jam packed full of them. Like I always remember reading this book for the first time and the level of shock that I had. And it really propelled me. Like, I felt like I got a lot of momentum to be passionate about the rest of the series just from like the last three chapters of this book. It's one of the best literary experiences I remember having, like reading these chapters. Wow, we need to get you, uh, we need to do like a top, Phantology does these uh, brackets for top uh, different moments in fantasy. So maybe this is one that you need to enter. We'll yes. See if we, we can get to that. But I will say on my reread, it was extremely frustrated when they were all gathered in the Shrieking Shack and just knowing who Sirius Black was, it takes, you read like four pages and Sirius doesn't tell the kids. Like obviously the kids are freaking out and Harry's like beside himself 
um, you know, Harry, like his revenge instinct kicks in and he's just seeing red, but Sirius like, doesn't just turn to them and tell them like, take your eyes off Pettigrew for a second and tell the kids who you are. That was, that was the only frustrating yeah. part for me. Yeah. Maybe he attempted to do that when we talked about like, if Harry hadn't hailed the night bus, would Sirius come and explain what was going on to Harry right away? But yeah, Sirius's uh, compulsion, fixation <laughs> up, upon Peter Pettigrew, it, it's not he a very good revenge. strategy. I know, but you, you can't, revenge. to get revenge, sometimes you got to involve others and explain what's going on a little bit. I mean, he did get Lupin. Yeah, Lupin, was helping him. Lupin kind of figures it out, but Sirius is all about Peter Pettigrew. Anyway, uh, events continue, so they chain up Peter rather than, rather than killing him. I kind of talked about this. Harry talks him down from killing. He says he doesn't want them to be murderers and they're going to turn in Pettigrew and clear Sirius's name and all this. And we're like, okay, yeah, it's going to go great. But of course it's not because as soon as they leave, the full moon rises and Lupin turns into a werewolf. Maybe Lupin should have known this was going to happen. Like this guy's got to yeah. live. He's got to live <laughs> around the lunar calendar. So maybe, I don't know. Maybe he lost yeah. track and all the excitement, but it doesn't well, really make sense. It That's does talk sh- about how Snape, Snape was giving Lupin, like we mentioned earlier, potions to remember who he was when he was a werewolf. And Lupin forgot to take his potion that day. That's true. Something like that. But he still would have turned into a werewolf. But um, yeah, I, okay, so he wouldn't have gone full on werewolf if he had taken the yeah. wolf's bane. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so then it, it's all messed up now because the crew is ambushed by Dementors and Harry and Sirius pass out. And Harry awake. Uh, Harry awakens the hospital wing, and everything has fallen apart. Sirius has been captured. He's being held. Whoa, Steven, you're missing the best part when someone saves them from the dementia. Yeah, right, right. So, so a mysterious figure saves them. Harry thinks it's uh, he thinks it's his dad. He thinks it's James because he sees the stag, Patronus. That, that's a good point. Yes. So uh, now they're in the hospital wing. Hermione's there. Ron is uh, he's like unconscious because he's broken his leg. And he's finally getting medical attention. And Dumbledore comes in and tells Hermione, hey, uh, Hermione, you've got that time turner thing. Why don't you go make this all right? Harry's completely lost. <laughs> no one explains it to him up until they go back in time. And, uh, and they go back and they save themselves. They save Buckbeak. They save Sirius. Harry is the one who casts the Patronus. I kind of like went through those events really quickly. Uh, but that's really kind of the pace that the book goes through. You, you get this all really fast. It's really exciting. Mm-hmm. So anything that you guys want to revisit here, uh, real focus. So, so I'm going to go. Um, so I sense I a you conspiracy this, theory but, about to be revealed. <laughs> so do you know what the hippogriff, what it symbolizes in, in the wizarding world? What the hippogriff symbolizes? No. No, enlighten us. So a mystical creature, the hippogriff, symbolizes love. And I'm just going to say this, that I... After Harry, I didn't know it when I first read the book, obviously, but when Harry and Hermione throughout the entire series, I will forever, no one will ever be able to change my mind that Harry should have ended up with Hermione. And this is just, I mean. Oh my gosh, man, you gotta get, you gotta get past this. No, it, Wait, it, it's be- true. <laughs> JK Wait. Rowling even said that was her biggest mistake in the entire series. Did she really say that? Yeah. We might need a fact well, check on that one. Well, I guess you can't argue with her, though. Well, I'm not sure but she really said it. I, I, want, I want a Twitter link or something. She, she, she said, said that. that. She said it in an interview. All right. I want, I, want a, I want an article on that. So the hippogriff symbolizes love. I've never heard that before. Um, but I guess I'll just kind of go with it because you're saying it and you sound confident. But uh, yeah. I don't know who's choosing that symbolism. It's like J.K. Rowling it's just in, saying. It's, in, it's just in the Harry Potter fantasy world. That's what it is. All right, what, whatever. So the hippogriff symbolizes love. Love is a big thing in Harry Potter. And uh, like I was kind of saying, one of the themes of this book is, you know, Harry, they, they save the hippogriff. They use the hippogriff to save Sirius. Harry pardons Pettigrew, uh, for lack of a better word. And at the end, Dumbledore kind of talks him through this. And Harry's like, man, you know, none of this did any good because Pettigrew escaped and he's going to help revive Voldemort and Sirius is still on the run. So everything I did was for naught. And Dumbledore says, well, don't you think, you know, it was valuable that you 
uh, release Pettigrew, and Pettigrew is now in your debt, and that mm -hmm. has big effects later in the series. And I, I really like this setup, and it it's some really nice, um, you know, strong positive ideas that are happening in the book. I don't know. I still think series should have gotten be free instead of having continued to be on the run. Well, I think we all would have liked for series to be free, but we don't get everything we want in books. Guys, I'm going to I'm going to uh, be a rain cloud on the serious parade that's going on right now. So, I just there I feel like there's a couple of major issues with Sirius. Well, I, actually maybe three major issues. I already talked about his fixation on Pettigrew and how he I mean, I'll I'll give him a little bit of a break cuz he just escaped Azkaban and obviously maybe wasn't able to think totally straight. But he could have gone about it a much better way. But the other thing, his story about almost killing Snape, like that's a really, really messed up thing to do. Oh, when he plays the trick on Snape and gets Snape oh, to go walk in on Lupin, turning into a werewolf? Yeah, that's terrible. I think it's funny. If, how is that? <laughs> Snape would have gotten obliterated by, the, by Lupin the werewolf. I thought that was awful. And then the thing about, I mean, Lots of uh, Sirius's actions have long-term ramifications. Um, none bigger than him at the last second backing out of the secret keeper role. Like, why did he not feel like he was up to that? No, so the story behind that is that everyone knew that it would be him that would be the secret keeper. And so to try to divert the attention from him and having Voldemort not find out that it's him, he changed it to Peter Pettigrew, but they didn't know that he was, he was a traitor. I'm not buying that. I feel like it's really common knowledge at Hogwarts that Mooney, Wormtail, Prongs, and Padfoot, they kind of rolled together. That was the crew. So if they try Sirius and it's not him, they're just going to go to Peter Harry's Pettigrew Godfather. right after. Yeah, that, that is the I'm explanation. Like, but, but yeah, it's, it's a good point, Dan. Like, if we really wanted to throw things off, we would have chosen someone other than Pettigrew also, as well. Dumbledore knew that Sirius wasn't their secret keeper, as did Lupin. Why wasn't Dumbledore the secret keeper? Yeah, that would have been the best option. The, I mean, the only good thing that Sirius does in this book for me is when he offers Harry to live with him over the summer, which is a really heartwarming moment that gets taken away right after. It's almost like a series of unfortunate events book where you think that things are going to be better and then yeah, it yeah. flips you, upside you, down immediately. <laughs> You think they're going to go to the good guardian and then it never works out at the end of the book? Yeah. Yeah, there's so, some similarities there too. So yeah, Sirius is kind of, he's always been like the bad boy that rolls with James and Lupin. Um, kind of like a, like your typical brooding fantasy protagonist, like a, like a Kaladin from Stormlight Archive. Yeah, like, I, I imagine. I like, see that. Like some stringy long hair. So, uh, Wait, Dan, have you read the Stormlight Archives? Yeah, yeah Dan's, being, Dan's being a poser right now. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to sneak in that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you need to read those. But, yeah, but yeah I, I mean, there are some issues with Sirius's plan here. My, my main thing is the fixation on Pettigrew. I think he could have come up with a better plan to ultimately achieve his goal here. Yeah. So I think um, we've kind of talked through the book. Um, let's let's go into our top top three. What do we do? Top three. We don't do top five, right? Top three. Top, yeah, we do uh, top, top three. three. Yeah, we, we do top three power rankings. So I know you've been waiting for these. We do power rankings every Harry Potter episode. So top three, bottom three, have based off of solely this book, how well they performed. So Dan, do you want to get us started? I think you have maybe a top three for us. Yeah, I was actually writing it down throughout the duration of this podcast because I forgot to do it beforehand. So hopefully <laughs> you guys slot ahead. So I'm, I'm trying to think outside the box, right? Because I think that this is more entertaining if I go outside the box. My top three, I'm going to have Crookshanks in the top three. Crookshanks, the only one that is able to see through uh, Sirius and Pettigrew for that matter. Well, She's Sirius talks to Crookshanks. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Um, yeah, yeah, they're so friends. Crookshanks trying to kill Scabbers, you know, the whole time. Crookshanks could have very well have been the hero had Ron not been protecting Scabbers, um, had he been successful. 
So really into Crookshanks. Also, I'm throwing Dumbledore in here. I'm throwing Dumbledore in just because he has gotten no love on the previous two podcasts. But he actually inserts himself into Harry's life a little bit more here. I feel like he gives um, Harry and Hermione the perfect amount of leeway for them to learn on their own and to save two lives with, uh, you know, the hospital scene where he tells them to use the time turner. I thought that was really cool as well as what Steven was talking about, that it's more valuable for Harry to save Pettigrew's life. I thought that sets up Harry for the future. And then the third one I'm going to put in the top three is Pettigrew, actually, because he's able to escape. And we learned that he's successfully been manipulating all of these people. Like he killed all of these people, but successfully pinned it on Sirius and has the entire wizarding world confused on this. And I thought that was actually kind of impressive for someone that's supposedly so like so incompetent compared to the other four marauders. Nice takes. Three. Nice takes. Okay, Nathan, let's do okay. your top three. My top three, number three is going to be Hermione. Um, I feel like throughout this book, she, I mean, she's taken like 10 different classes and she looks after Harry when he gets the firebolt, even though Harry and Ron and everyone else want to use it. And Hermione's like, super like oh no no, we got to check um and then number number one is going to be Sirius Black wait number two number two is oh number two oh yeah number two is Harry okay Harry's always out there yeah (laughs) no just because I mean his I I really like Harry in this book I mean I totally understand like his revenge thing that he just wants to revenge for his parents and then number number one is Sirius for successfully escaping Azkaban, being the only person ever to do so. Okay, my number three, or my, my top three, are as follows. Uh, my number three, I'm going to go Hermione as well. I think this is a strong Hermione book. She, once again, gets a lot done and, and helps out the boys quite a bit. I'm going to go number two, Ron, I think Ron has some nice moments and he has not previously gotten any love at all from us, but, but he is a bit of a hero uh, with the broken leg thing. Even though he unfortunately is not involved in the Time Turner escapades at the end, which is unfortunate for him because he really missed out on some, some really nice adventure. But yeah, Ron, we're going number two there. And number one is Lupin, easily. I don't know how you guys miss Lupin in your top three because he is, he is very cool. And even though he kind of flubs it with the werewolf calendar thing and not yeah, taking thought... the potion, like he, he still is a really good, uh, he's, he's really good kind of father figure for Harry and a good example of like what a successful wizard can be. Because look, he's been living as a werewolf his entire life, been able to make it okay. I'm impressed by Lupin. Lupin, Lupin yeah. was my top three until that last part when he totally just lapsed his potion that he was supposed to take. And also, Lupin's a little bit cowardly because he knows about the entrance at the One-Eyed Witch to Hogsmeade, but he doesn't tell Dumbledore. That that prevented me from putting him into the top three as well. And yeah, the wolf potion, like he screws that up. He could have been the uh, Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher forever. So it's kind well, of no one, no one can be because Tom Riddle cursed it, right? True. Yeah. Okay, let's go bottom three now. My top three might have been a little suspect. We'll go bottom three, Dan, start us off. Okay, for bottom three, I think this is the third straight book. I might be wrong, but I'm putting Hagrid into the bottom three. And what really cements his position here for me is that at the end of the book, you get a little scene with Hagrid and you find out um, they're telling him about Pettigrew getting away and stuff. Hagrid Hagrid cares 0% about this. He does not... for such a supposedly like nice guy, like such an empathetic guy, he has kind of a, he gets kind of tunnel vision on his magical creatures. Like all he cares about is Buckbeak. And like he could care less about stuff that actually matters. Apologies to Buckbeak. Um, and that going along with his carelessness that he exhibits in every book, I'm going to put him in the bottom three. I'm also putting Malfoy in for reasons that we've already discussed. And I'm putting Sirius into my bottom three because there are 
much, much more efficient ways that he could have revealed himself to Harry for someone that is supposedly a loving godfather. His mind is much more on the revenge than cultivating his relationship with Harry. He doesn't think about Harry at all during this book, from what I can tell. And like he's in the Gryffindor common room. He could write him a note or something. Like, I don't know. Not he really into serious the book. Yeah, he sends him the oh gosh, that totally slipped my mind, actually. See, that doesn't go with his character though. If he's sending him the firebolt, why not appear to him in the Gryffindor common room or like give some indication to what is true, like that he's innocent. But do you really think Harry would have believed him? I think he would have. Would have been interesting, I think, if Sirius was to appear, how Harry would have reacted. Or at least he could have revealed himself to Lupin as well. Like Lupin knows Sirius longer. He probably could have got a Lupin on his side first and then they could have approached Harry. Sirius get into the castle. That was what Snape suspected that Lupin was helping him, but he actually yeah. he actually wasn't. So Nathan, Dan put <laughs> your number one as his <laughs> bottom number one. Let's hear your yeah. top, or let's hear your bottom three. Bottom three, number three is Dumbledore. Um, I don't see myself putting Dumbledore anywhere near the top three for any of the foreseeable future. I just... Ooh. For being the most powerful wizard, and I still stand by the fact that Dumbledore knew that Sirius was innocent, and he didn't do anything. He didn't save Buckbeak. Um, number two would be Ron. Um, I am not a Ron fan. Um, he doesn't. He just complains half the book about Scavers, and doesn't really add anything. All he cares about is Harry's firebolt and scabbers. Yeah, and, this is this is nothing new. We know you hate Ron. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> number number one it was probably probably going to be Hagrid. Um, I feel like as a professor, he could have done so much better um, with teaching wise, and been, he, if he was actually. A good teacher who would have found out how to actually teach them and not get students injured. Okay, thank you for those bottom three submissions, guys. Here's my three. So my number three is Neville. Unfortunately, we like to love Neville, but he lost the pass. Like he wrote down the passwords, and then he lost them. And series entered the con. Like this is way bad for Neville. But Crookshanks stole them from the common room. You, you yeah. thought Neville was supposed to like safeguard them in his own common room? But yeah, I see I, what you're saying. I guess, but it's it's like his fault, right? So <laughs> yeah. Which really kind of brings the whole school to its knees. Yeah, it's a died. total Neville. It's a total Neville thing. Yeah, unfortunate for him, but it does happen. Number two, I'm going to say like anyone associated with uh, Gryffindor Quidditch opponents. So this includes <laughs> Cedric Diggory, Cho Chang, and Draco Malfoy. Because they all have super bad moments. Draco cheating, Cho Chang bad strategy, Cedric Diggory not accepting a victory and trying to be like overly noble and obnoxious and saying that it shouldn't count. That was, obno- that was obnoxious to me. <laughs> let's let's be professional yeah. here. You take yeah. the W and you walk off the court. So so that was that was annoying. And then yeah, I'm going with Dan here. I thought Sirius was way bad in this book. He's better in the future, but He's a terrible guardian here. And like you said, if he was really concerned about helping Harry, he had lots of opportunities to do so. All he cares about is getting this revenge on a rat. And <laughs> hey, he did he did watch Harry play Quidditch. Okay. But that's not doing anything godfatherly or guardian no no guardian duties being uh, being put out there. I mean sure he gives him the I- I want to add someone to my bottom three. Yeah. Who's that? The Dementors. Yeah. The, the sole purpose of the job of the Dementors was to catch Sirius, and they, they all, they, I mean, they only got him because he was injured from Werewolf Lupin. Right. Yeah. Dementors, obviously. Um, I mean, I mean, I don't really know if we can put him in the bottom three because. They're just forces of nature, but they didn't do very well. They failed to catch yeah. Sirius. 
All right, guys, any parting shots here on Harry Potter 3? Yeah, I, I just want to say Malfoy should probably be a perpetually be in the bottom three. He doesn't have a single good moment, and he fakes breaking his arm for three months, and he can't even get the hippogriff killed or Hagrid fired. You know, so. he does finally <laughs> turn it around in the very last scene of the last book, right? Yeah. So maybe, maybe then he will... At least avoid well, he the does, bottom I mean, three. Even then, in the seventh book, he does have a good moment when they're in Malfoy Manor. Yeah, he's he's turning yeah. out a little bit maybe by the end, but yeah, maybe he shouldn't be eligible for these initial ones because he's just so bad. And I just want to say that if I'm ever in a hideout on the run, um, that you two are going to be my secret keepers for the Fidelius charm. Oh, Oh, I have to pick one, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully who's ever um, looking for you doesn't listen to this podcast. Oh. Oh, man. Yeah, so maybe that's true, because Phantology, Phantology does have a lot of listeners. We um, do. Yeah, that's a... All right. It's Just kidding. It's not going to be you guys. But you guys can sign my Hogsmeade permission slip. How about that? Done. Yeah, the Hogsmeade permission slip. One of... <laughs> yeah. Ridiculous. I'm sorry. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for reviewing book three. Dan, one more thing. I was just going to say that my sneak scope will never go off around you guys because you're, you're both of the highest character. Thanks. <laughs> I, I just thanks, I, I had sneak scope in my notes and I realized we never talked about it, but I didn't, I didn't care. Like, it's fine. We didn't talk about it. You thanks for that. Thanks for that. Yeah, thanks for that corny ending. That was perfect. Just what we need. Yeah. All right. Thanks for listening. If you like Phantology, check us out at Phantology Books. Uh, PhantologyBooks.com is our website with everything else. And chat with us on Discord. Give us your Harry Potter theories. Tell us the mistakes we made. And uh, thanks for listening. And we will get you next time. See you later, Dan and Nathan. See ya. Peace.